Tonight, I'm announcing that I will direct all states, tribes, and territories to make all adults, people 18 and over, eligible to be vaccinated no later than May 1. We have gone from 6% of U.S. adults with one shot on the day the president took office to more than 60% in just four months. All right, well, as we've been telling you, frontline workers are among the first to receive the vaccine. And this morning, we're joined by two of them who are going to get their vaccinations live. Oh my gosh, I'm talking to you and I feel bad I that you're getting a wanna... shot. An upstate New York hospital near Syracuse will stop delivering babies in its maternity unit next week after too many workers resigned over vaccine mandates. This Louisiana State Board of Elementary and Secondary Education meeting was adjourned after a ruckus crowd refused to put on masks. Science is not fact. Science is meant to be challenged. There is no pandemic amongst children. Over the past year, demonstrations have swept the globe. Our trust in media and governments seems to have completely eroded. And we've become so fractured as a society we can't even agree to protect one another from a deadly virus. Conspiracy has fractured our lens. My name is Charles Creel. Disinformation has been my personal project for several years, from monitoring disinformation spread and impact in war zones to advising governments on fighting propaganda campaigns within their own borders. The normalization of disinformation is now so complete that as we speak, nearly 50 million Americans believe the country is run by a cult of blood-drinking pedophiles. We know who you are. No more masks. How did we get here? I need help. I think I have, I think I'm the coronavirus. Turn off your car. I'm scared too. I don't want you to hurt me. Nobody's gonna hurt you. <laughs> We had a global pandemic happening at the same time as a racial justice pandemic, happening at the same time as an economic disruption. What ended up happening was it was the perfect storm. It's hard to discuss conspiracy without talking about QAnon. It's a multi-conspiracy that's grown to near religious popularity, scooping up other conspiracies in the process. Mia Bloom, a professor with Georgia State University, co-wrote the book Pastels and Pedophiles, Inside the Mind of QAnon. Part of the problem is that, unlike in the olden days where the news was decidedly objective and you wouldn't have known what position Walter Cronkite personally took or who he voted for, in the last 20 years, especially with the ascendancy of Fox News, you've had very curated contents. In many ways, it becomes an echo chamber where people only get news with which they agree People don't trust the news. They don't know what they're seeing is actually true. They don't know if they're reading things on Facebook, if that's rumor or fact. And so you have the normal psychological processes of confirmation bias, people doubling and tripling down. No, that's okay. That's, <laughs> it, it doesn't matter too much to me as long as you've got a good shot. So yeah, it's there's a, it's a compromise of a thing. You could- That's all right. Yep. Kyle is one of the smartest people I know. He's worked in politics in the U.S. and now runs a charitable organization aimed at keeping voting fair and transparent in the United Kingdom. He's also written a book exploring how big tech has broken our society and what we can do about it. The amount of information we are now exposed to on a regular basis is simply incomprehensible for our brains. And so we're rewiring our brains to make faster decisions because of information overload. And the fastest decision you can make is to disregard stuff that doesn't reaffirm something that's already been ticked off in your mind. And so even though you could go and find the truth, you don't want to. To try to dig to the bottom of the problem, I thought I'd start with a professor of history. Students, when they arrive on a campus, 
are very skeptical. In fact, some of them have even completely tuned off of social media. And some of them will even say to me, in a fake news class, I don't follow the news anymore. So historians know that fake news has been with us really forever. One can go back to ancient Greece, one can go back to the Roman Republic, medieval Europe. And so what I like to do in my classes is start out with some historical examples. And then we move up to the 21st century. Am I good, Charles? Yeah. Okay. My name is Nina Jankowitz. Uh, my current title is Disinformation Fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank here in Washington. I would have preferred the, count the title Counter Disinformation Fellow, but nobody asked me, so here we are. You use the term fake news. I really hate the term fake news, even though it is in the subtitle of my book. Uh, it's not a helpful term because it's become so politicized lately. And politicians, they love to use that term to describe anything that's politically inconvenient. And really, disinformation isn't cut and dry untrue. It often is grounded in a kernel of truth or in lived experience and emotion. And that's what makes it so powerful. So to describe it all as false is just incorrect. Raymond, fondly called Dr. Ray by his patients, runs a chiropractic clinic in South Carolina. For a chiropractor, he has an enormous following on social media, popularity he gained by posting memes, criticizing vaccinations, and the official COVID narrative. Um, yeah, so I, yeah, as far as news-wise, I try to stay away from the news. Very negative. I'm a very optimistic person. So what I do is I surround myself around like-minded people and really take it in to see what that, what that does with me and how I can use the information, essentially. I think the reason why uh, they're, I guess, losing the trust in the uh, population and the community is because for, I feel like for so many years, we have been lied to for certain things. If you've been in any type of relationship, when you are lied to, it doesn't feel good and you lose trust and you may like, okay, I forgive you and we can continue our relationship. But if you continue to do the same things over and over now, the relationship can't be. Bill Howard leads the University of Oxford's Internet Institute. There is not one person I know with more knowledge about what goes on behind the digital curtain. All of us have cognitive biases, right? We, we like information that fits decisions we've already made. We lean into politicians who look like us, who sound like us. We respond well to messages that confirm things we already believe. And so, since many of us like to know the truth, we're, we're eager to know if, if there's a conspiracy out there, um, that means some of us consume more and more conspiratorial content. I've chased disinformation's tail since I worked for UK Parliament. I've been in digital since the late 80s, before the web, and I've witnessed firsthand how technology has rushed ahead of us, leaving us scrambling to catch up, both privately and at the level of the law. But without essential trust in our institutions, we've been left adrift, casting about to find our own facts. Social media is designed to take advantage of those cognitive biases. And so that may mean that uh, some social media users get more and more and more content that solidifies, uh, that makes them more confident that the things they believe are true. How did the problem get this bad? Well, one answer we could probably all recite by now. There are chat rooms and on Telegram and social media. For social media. A few other spots on social media. Uh, allowing them access to digital megaphones through social media. Engaging on social media. The one benefit we have with the large social media companies. Or on social media. Social media in and of itself. She was fairly popular on social media. But it's become more of a problem because social media platforms have become the way in which it is mainly shared. And it's not just that, that disinformation exists in Facebook groups and on Twitter. It's the fact that platforms 
amplify and promote uh, disinformation. But let's look at what would have happened to somebody before the internet if they thought the Earth was flat. They live in a small village and they think to themselves, you know what, I think the Earth might be flat. They go down to the pub on a Friday and they say to their friends, you know, I think the Earth might be flat. So everyone else in the pub would be like, you're out of your mind. The Earth isn't flat. It's obviously round for all these reasons. And that person would then go either, ooh, okay, I'm still going to believe this, but it's not socially acceptable, so I'm not going to talk about it anymore. Or they would change their mind because enough people they knew and trusted told them the Earth isn't flat. Now what does that person do? Well, they go home, they find the Flat Earth Society on Facebook, which has three million plus members globally, and they go, oh, my people. Why is this happening? People have asked me what can be done, and the hard truth is there's no silver bullet. But I do know the starting point that a lot of people come at it with, and that that point is getting us nowhere. Albert Watkins says, quote, a lot of these defendants, and I'm going to use this colloquial term, perhaps disrespectfully, but they're all effing short bus people. These are people with brain damage. They're effing retarded. They're on the goddamn spectrum. What was either said to me or implied to me was that it happens because moms are stupid or because moms are credulous and not skeptical enough. I wouldn't even call it skepticism because skepticism is like in its root a positive thing. I would encourage people to be skeptical to things. Dr. Kave Rashidi has spent the last year fighting the pandemic and vaccine skepticism on the front line in Norway. But the people he's fighting are just as determined. That you're being deceived based on very, very simple research. But this is just more like stupidity and people who think that their stupidity is worth something. <laughs> what if I sit like this? Is it too uh... No, it's fine. It's okay. Absolutely fine. I kjenner know that ingen som har blitt smitta av COVID-19. Det er helt ærlig. Eh, jeg faktisk spurt på sociale medier i ulike diskusjonsgrupper. Og det er heller ingen der som kjenner noen som har blitt smittet. Og det synes jeg er litt rart. Vårt fokus på markeringen for frihet er derfor frihet, sannhet, empati og kjærlighet. Man hører jo om smittetall, ikke sant? Man hører om travle sykehus, men det, det stemmer ikke med, med personlig um, research. <laughs> I knew just sort of on a, on a gut level that that wasn't right. Sofia Moskalenko is a psychologist, and along with Mia Bloom is the co-author of the QAnon book Pastels and Pedophiles. It's, it's not true uh, that people who fall for conspiracy theories are somehow mentally um, deficient. Then there are issues that psychologists would talk about, and they would see the problem as being that of our embedded identities. In other words, the person I am, the beliefs I have, will make me very resistant to, say, better information. And I think that's important when we talk about conspiracy ideologies. These ideologies serve a function. They do something with people. They have an identity function, and this is why they believe in that. Case studies that I've worked through for my book for QAnon, there were Harvard graduates and successful business owners and people with advanced degrees, lawyers and medical doctors. Because they fulfill these needs that people have. It's not that they are crazy or, or stupid or whatever. It's um, they, they follow something that offers them a promise. They come to feel that some important truth about the world and the reality is being hidden from them. And they're on a quest to discover this truth 
in psychology, we define it as a generalized distrust um, against everyone who is perceived as powerful. So it's not just a problem of Google or Facebook or Twitter pre-selecting things that they think I will like, but the problem is actually me. When we think about these groups, we think about the push and the pull factors. What are the things that are sort of structural conditions that make involvement in QAnon more likely? And then what are the outputs? Like, what am I benefiting from being a part of a conspiracy? And that's where we get these ideas from studying terrorism and seeing these exact same dynamics with terrorism. Analysts have been tracking terrorism around the world for at least 50 years. These file boxes represent the history of that work. In the 1970s, a group began tracking terrorism uh, by using international wire services, local newspaper articles, any information they could find about terrorist attacks happening around the globe. And they wrote uh, the details of the events on these pieces of paper. Um, so they recorded where the, uh, the attack occurred, who was responsible for committing the attack, how many people were hurt or killed, uh, the types of weapons that were used. And for about 35 years, that's how terrorism data was collected. So this document here is, is showing some of the statistics that we've uh, compiled on individuals who have committed crimes um, on behalf of their commitment to the QAnon conspiracy theory. Everything from trespassing to vandalism to property destruction, um, all the way up to kidnapping and, and actual homicides. Um, these offenders appear to be a bit different than your average type of, of criminal extremist uh, in a couple of ways. For one is that they tend to be quite a bit older than the average person that gets involved in an extremist group. And most of these individuals were in their 40s or 50s at the time that they committed these crimes. These are individuals that have been married, they have children, in some cases they had grandchildren, they've had careers. And as I was doing the research, because I had studied women and terrorism, one of the things that struck me is that QAnon was appealing to women in the exact same way that ISIS had appealed to young women, which is, did you want to help the children? We also find that you know, looking at these individuals, we see that a number of women have been uh, particularly active in the QAnon movement. Um, and that's surprising because in most extremist groups, it's usually less than 5% of, of members or participants are females. Um, in the QAnon community, it's a much larger percentage of, of individuals. A far-right conspiracy theorist was planning a kidnapping. Investigators say that she believed her child had been taken by a satanic pedophilia ring of Democrats that is being secretly battled by President Trump. That's the, the QAnon conspiracy theory. And of course, the woman's instinct is always, of course I want to help the children. It's really important to understand that Individuals don't join extremist groups, they don't join radical religious movements, they don't join cults, they don't adopt conspiracy theories because they think it will ruin their lives. The QAnon photos. They do it because they think these groups and movements have tapped into something that is, is really good um, and that by helping that they can play a meaningful role in making the world a better place. You see that it's battered, bruised and bleeding white children especially girls, one by one by one, showing they're all white and they're all bruised and bleeding. Now, of course, this is movie blood and it's makeup. They're not actually bruised and bleeding. They're showing images from Greek mythology. I think this is Cronus eating his children. And they're using this to say, you see, they've been eating the children forever. This one says, diversity will never bring her back. I mean, this could have been a picture taken in 1939. And the idea is that it's always white children. One day they will ask, why didn't you fight for my future? Overwhelmingly white children, battered and bruised, because they understood their audience were the yoga moms. Because they understood their audience were the yoga moms. QAnon's audience was the yoga moms? I wanted to know why the wellness community had taken such offense over vaccines, adopting everything from the QAnon Save the Children hashtag to 5G theory. That's the one where people have been destroying cell phone towers because they believe they spread COVID. 
The wellness community is a movement advocating for health through diet, meditation, and regular spiritual practice, but it's also a hugely profitable and vastly diverse industry with its share of extremes. And one by one, spiritual and physical teachers have been spreading what I would call extremist ideology. And that, but it sounds like that wasn't a COVID thing for you. You were already before that. Because before that, yeah, I was yeah. already that way before that. Plandemic was the gateway drug for most of the yoga community. And because, you know, the yoga community was already into, you know, natural medicine or alternative to Western medicine, herbs and aromatherapy and essential oils, QAnon ends up becoming completely wrapped up in that part of the wellness community. Plandemic, the propaganda documentary that swept the internet at the start of the pandemic. Coronaviruses are in every animal. So if you've ever had a flu vaccine, you were injected with coronaviruses. So I wasn't always an anti-vaxxer. I, um, I was a quality control chemist for a pharmaceutical plant before I had kids. And I was very pro-science. I even took my daughter to her two-month vaccines. But when I went to her eight week appointment, I kind of had this like second thought, like we're not going to be able to undo this if she has a reaction. I would think there's something like deeply evolutionary in us that tells us that it's wrong to inject some foreign body into, into your body. So when it comes to vaccines, what, and I don't know if you guys see the shirt, but it's organic human. And when I started reporting on anti-vaccine groups um, more than a decade ago, it was mostly people on the far left who were populating these groups. It was people who um, were skeptical of GMOs. It was people who were worried about um, putting impure things into their bodies and their kids' bodies. I'm originally from Mississippi. I'm from one, one of the, the sickest states in America. I was vaccinated as a child. Right? I didn't have a choice, but pretty much what happened was my, my grandparents were just doing what, what they just do, right? Just like, hey, this is what you do. You have a kid, you get them vaccinated. I went through with the vaccines. She got three shots in that day. And later that evening, she became very upset. She, like before she was kind of starting to be a little more of a person and less of a potato, you know, like newborns are <laughs> kind of don't really do much. And I felt like, a lot of that was lost, and um, when she did stop crying, she slept this really deep sleep that kind of scared me. So the next morning I called. The flu vaccines increased the odds by 36% of getting COVID-19. And, and the nurse was very dismissive, like, that's just normal, your baby's gonna be back to normal in a couple days. And I just kind of felt really, really blown off, really embarrassed, like, Maybe I am just a dumb first-time mom. I don't know what I'm doing. The anti-vax movement is an interesting one because it's actually been around for several decades. In many ways, it precedes social media. It's a movement uh, that's much more middle class than most of the extremist movements we've seen online. It's moms, it's middle class parents who are worried about their kids, uh, who wonder if Western science has left them behind or, or hears their concerns about quality of life for their kids. What caused you to feel that way about vaccination? Severe vaccine injuries in my family. So I have a 23-year-old, um, barely functionable cousin. And um, there was three in that line of family, so. And so I, I think there's a natural resistance to it. Like generally speaking, the last couple of million years, thinking like that would make you survive. Then you started having on yoga Instagram, like the head of Booty Yoga started um, disseminating Plandemic and a lot of these ideas about save the children, save our children last summer. And so it was very unusual to be on yoga Instagram and have, you know, images instead of sunsets and motivational phrases, pictures of bloodied and battered white children with the hashtag, save our children, save the children. 
Is it safe to say that anything that cannot be patented has been shut down intentionally because there's no way to profit from it? All these natural remedies that we have had for ever. Absolutely, that's fair to say, and that's exactly what's going on in COVID-19. So I looked online, and that's when they told me, you know, like, oh, it's cryencephalitis. You know, your baby probably had some brain swelling, and, and she was in a lot of pain, and she was crying, and it terrified me. And I, you know, I read the information they gave me, and it didn't take much, you know, after a scary experience with no explanation to turn me into an anti-vaxxer. It's not what we do. So our kids have never been vaccinated. They've never had antibiotics. Um, we all, we do everything natural. My kids are 100% unvaccinated. So they've never even had a vaccination and they're 100% healthy. I couldn't vaccinate her after that ever again. And I went on to have two more children and I didn't vaccinate them either. And you saw that the yoga community jumped in, you know, with both feet. And this is how in many ways, you see so many women supporting QAnon. It's not four years in the making. It was really just in the last year. But it didn't start with QAnon or with COVID. It started well before that. Shortly before um, Trump came into office, I began to see another strain. And that strain was more of a libertarian strain. They thought that the government was forcing them to put something in their body that they didn't want to put in their bodies. They didn't want to be told what to do. So it really, really picked up steam when COVID hit. At that point, you saw people who thought that coronavirus was a hoax. Why are you worried that you're going to get sick from somebody? If you had any kind of sense and you're vegan and you're into holistic nutrition, you would know that this whole thing is one big hoax. Yes. Oh, pastel QAnon? Yeah. yeah. Pastel Anon? <laughs> Groups that had been mostly about vaccines before you know, at this point, evenly, I would say, between people on the left and people on the right took on a really, really right wing flavor. Dude, I saw a man the other day and the motherfucker was wearing a mask inside the car. Come on, homeboy. Are you? <laughs> and then, you know, you started to see some of the QAnon conspiracy theory um, stuff creep into those groups as well. Find any small cell tower that you can find figure out where the location is how close it is to you and all of a sudden you're start to starting to feel these symptoms the frequencies are being turned up these are the same symptoms that this illness that's been going around for months causes um i think and also in the anti-vaxxer scene in Germany, they use the so-called yellow badge the, um, from National Socialism era and uh, portrayed themselves as the no Jews um, who are suffering as much because they're forced to vaccinate so that you see the yellow patch now everywhere in this demonstration. That didn't really surprise me because I knew it from the anti-vaxxer movement. And you have there like, I don't know, a nurse sitting who likes homeopathy and herbal medicine and other people who promote Nazi groups, uh, yeah, Nazi religious groups. And for many people, it was really surprising to see who went with whom on these demonstrations. You had like hippies, nature lovers, people from the political center and yeah, people from the far right, fascist, neo-Nazis, and they all were marching together. I think what you see when you see the, the similarities emerging with the sort of far right and far left communities coming to the same end in the, like, in sort of the, you know, pastel QAnon and the wellness movements, as well as the sort of white supremacists, is there's a few factors. So one is the purity of their points of view, right? And this is what this is why, you know, I never like to think of a political spectrum as left right, but more of a circle. Because if you get far enough to the left or far enough to the right, you sort of almost end up coming back to the same place. And it's that purity of view that sort of is the starting place. Then you layer in a a really serious sense of tribalism, right? Like my people, my community. The rest of the world is trying to get you. How very strange. 
Now, I would say someone who was pro-green living in natural health foods would never agree with someone who's deeply conservative. But now what seemed to have happened was that the far left and far right finally found one thing they agreed on, vaccines. And uh, I noticed a shift over the years to this like libertarian right wing movement, but also like more conspiracy theories. Like people would share that they were flat earthers and it was considered rude to call it out. Like you couldn't even say like, come on, this is what, <laughs> like, this is what we believe now. But I, I definitely believe that there is an alternative agenda. I definitely believe the pharmaceutical company pushes things for another mode. I don't believe that our interest is in, is in their best interest. I believe that it's more to fill their pockets. I like to think about it like this. There's three levels of healthcare. So if we look at it like this pyramid, the first bottom layer is the treatment of disease. The second layer is the preven prevention of disease. And the top layer is going to be the promotion of health and wellness. Preventive medicine is an extremely effective way of battling disease. Um, one of three cases of cancer uh, is thought to be preventable by things like diet, exercise, not smoking. In the situation we are in now, you won't have a chance against the virus in a society by telling them to take more vitamin D or eat healthier or uh, exercising more. It's kind of like pouring a cup of water over a forest fire. In America, what we see is treatment of disease. Treatment of disease. That's all, all right? And right now, in these times, we've seen a little bit of prevention of disease and talking about washing your hands, doing these things. Um, but we haven't seen the promotion of health and wellness. And so I think that's the reason why these communities like yoga, chiropractors, uh, naturopaths, we know that, hey, you need to be making sure you're sleeping, you're moving your body, you're meditating, you're um, doing all these things that's essential for the human body. And so especially the yoga community and the far left communities that were anti-vax or vaccine hesitant, what ended up happening was they jumped on board QAnon. As QAnon picked up a lot of these adjacent conspiracies, they pulled in women from all sides of the political spectrum. According to this repeated nationwide survey, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Why not change to camels? The other thing was that, you know, many of the women were already a little bit circumspect about mainstream medicine. Um, we have lots of women who feel that even OBGYNs, they are way too quick to use cesarean sections or they're way too quick to do some sort of procedure on women uh, preemptively. And so there is just a general healthy skepticism from women when you think about all these studies that are done and they don't involve women, so then the results are skewed. Even burned food won't stick to Teflon, so it's always easy to clean. Cookware never needs scouring. If it has DuPont, Teflon. DuPont had a secret. It never told the American public or many... Of In a system that's failed families again and again, everything boils down to loss of trust. It's a bombardment of uh, some city in Vietnam where my dad was stationed. He was an aerial reconnaissance officer and he shot this photo and my grandfather blew it up and made a frame out of it. So my dad has been uh, dead for a little over 10 years um, and he died as a result of exposure to Agent Orange in Vietnam which gave him multiple myeloma. Gosh. Exposure to Agent Orange made by Monsanto, right? So like, I, I get it. I get it. You know, women are primary caretakers in the United States still. As you go to the store in the last couple of decades, it's become a chore to try to find healthful foods for the children that don't contain any of these chemicals produced by science that can be detrimental and damaging to the children's health. Same thing with medicine. You know, women are the ones who have to care for sick children, so when there is a recall... Recall of infant ibuprofen 
It's been expanded. These ibuprofen oral suspension drops right here are now found to have higher levels of the medication and could make your child sick. It's women who are then responsible for keeping on top of this information and guarding their children. Would you agree with me that your product should not be used where there is uh, impure water? Yes or no? Uh, we give all the instructions. Just, just, yeah. just answer. What would you? What of is your position? Of course not. But we cannot cope not. with that. Turn off your car for me now. Okay. What's your name? Jessica. Jessica, turn off the car for me, please. My legal name is Jessica Prince. Say again. My legal name is Jessica Prince. Well, a Peoria woman was arrested in New York City after telling officers she was the coronavirus. 37-year-old Jessica Prim Facebook Live the entire scene, telling officers she thought President Donald Trump was speaking directly to her in his televised press conferences. In order to understand why some people fall for QAnon, we need to think about where they are emotionally. People who are extremely anxious, who feel out of control in their lives, who feel like their government betrayed their expectations, whose religion had violated their trust, people who are fearful for their future and their children's future. Somebody sent me the YouTube video, Fall of Cabal, and I watched part five. I don't know if you've seen it. Part five. Part five. Part five. It talks about the elite eating children. I mean, I can show it all to you, okay? You know, radicalization often occurs because of very real victimization, right? There are groups that are mistreated in every society and that, that grievance, the traumatic experiences around that type of victimization can be the trigger for radicalization. These individuals could be looking to protect their communities. And for some individuals, they come to believe that the best way to protect their communities is to do it through violent action. We know from psychology research that being out of control is hugely unpleasant. Uh, people try to avoid it as much as they can. They will pay a price in order to gain some measure of control, even if that measure is completely um, unrelated to their actual control. So they will engage in superstitious behaviors that give them an idea that they're in control, but in fact, they're just running in circles. Have you, have you guys heard about the kids? Yeah. Okay. Like, they're not mine. They're coming. I'm just going to place you in handcuffs, all right? You're not under arrest. You're detained at the moment for your safety and ours, okay? You're putting me in handcuffs, you guys. All of us have contributed to something like a conspiracy theory, even if it didn't reach the magnitude of QAnon. Imagine yourself getting your car fixed, coming out of the body shop, and feeling like you've been ripped off. You might share it with a friend or two, either in person, or on social media. And those people might say something like, well, listen, you know what? All mechanics are scam artists. Your friend might tell you, you know, there's this whole conspiracy with the car manufacturers and mechanics where they have flaws in the car design that can cause catastrophic failures. They do it in order to supply never ending stream of customers to the mechanics. Instead of going and searching whether, in fact, there is any evidence of such a conspiracy, you kind of nod along again. And you come out of this interaction feeling better about yourself. Now you're not helpless anymore. You're not stupid. It's just those mechanics and car manufacturers are evil and out to get you. And so the responsibility for this whole fiasco all of a sudden is shifted from you and onto somebody else, and instead of feeling embarrassed and humiliated, you feel this righteous anger. Look, we don't call. The average person that is not sure about taking the COVID vaccine or vaccines in general, they're not anti-vaxxers, they're vaccine hesitant. And, and really, and, you know, their feeling about vaccines is, oh, I don't know. It's, I'm just overwhelmed by not knowing what to believe anymore. So let's say you're a vaccine skeptic, right? 
And one, how you became a vaccine skeptic is probably through some disinformation ecosystem that starts with a, you know, who we would call like a verified source, right? Like somebody you know or trust. And a lot of people will probably relate to getting a text message from someone who says something like, a good friend of mine works in a hospital and they said, right? And that's what we hear most often is that they, they are in a state of epistemic crisis. They don't really know where to find out what is true. That's the seed, right? That's planting the seed of doubt. So, okay, somebody says that to you, and then you go, all right, well, I'm gonna do a Google search about this. And you search, like, is the vaccine safe? And now Google's learning, okay, this person is questioning whether vaccines are safe. From there, you then move yourself into maybe a YouTube video, and the YouTube video is getting you a little bit more extreme, a little bit more extreme, a little bit more extreme, each autoplay as you go along. But what you're doing is you're teaching the algorithm, right? The algorithm is learning, okay, this person likes this content. And because the, the sole goal is to be able to place more ads to sell you more stuff, the content will get worse and worse and worse, and it will get more and more extreme. Misinformation has been injected into a sensitive and delicate and complex and necessarily complex scientific debate by very, very organized, deliberate and smart misinformation agents. And, and, and until ultimately you're in a, an entire ecosystem, an entire culture surrounded by the idea that, that that nugget that somebody saying, I heard something from a friend, has become your worldview. Right? And that worldview becomes your, your identity and the people who believe it are your tribe. And now you're deeply incentivized to maintain that belief system because if you don't, then you're gonna lose your friends, you're gonna lose your community, you're gonna lose your understanding of the world. These are conspiracy coins. They started selling them the year I was born, in 1963, which is also the year that uh, John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And what it is, is it's a penny with Abraham Lincoln on it, but a little image of John F. Kennedy stamped onto it. And what it does is it gives you lots of amazing coincidences between John F. Kennedy and Abraham Lincoln, both of whom were assassinated. Some of the coincidences are like silly things, like there were seven letters in, in each of their names, but more odd stuff, like both of their successors were named Johnson. Or Lincoln had a secretary named Kennedy, and Kennedy had a secretary named Lincoln. Very odd stuff. It's a little conspiracy, and it's a little token to, to sort of ward off the idea that we live in sheer and total chaos and that we have no control over the world at all. Uh, and this kind of holds that at bay. But they're just tokens. It's just something that's being sold to you. What I'm wondering is if I'm buying conspiracy, not a token of conspiracy, but real conspiracy, then who's doing the selling? We are an organization set up to uh, disrupt the activities of people who produce, who distribute misinformation, hatred online, and also to force change, change the culture uh, and the decisions being taken by the platforms which have given these people a safe haven to host their information, but also have promoted it through their algorithms to billions of people around the world. Our most recent research report was the Disinformation Dozen, which looks at 12 key anti-vaxxers and the organisations behind them. So we calculate that two thirds of all misinformation shares came from just these 12 people and their organisations. Of all the misinformation, 60% of the misinformation came from 12 individuals. There's about 12 people who are producing 65% of anti-vaccine misinformation on social media platforms. They're killing people. And we uh, looked at their tactics, their strategies, and also the ways in which they have 
made money from the pandemic. I mean, for them, COVID has been Christmas. Think about their future. Take, Take off, off their masks. Please stop masking. Stop masking your children. Bitte, hört auf, euren Kindern eine Maske aufzusetzen. Vær så snill. Trække ansigtsmaske på dine skønne barn. Please, stop masking your kids. Please, stop masking your kids. Please, please, please. Stop masking your kids. Near the top of the list is Sia G and his partner Kelly Brogan. Sia G runs something called GreenMedInfo.com, uh, has claimed all sorts of things, including that the Pfizer vaccine has killed more people than COVID, which is bananas. And I encourage everyone to go to your website. We'll say it again at the end. And also go to Questioning COVID, where we have a lot of your videos already set up for the red pill of going down the rabbit hole, asking are germs real, what are viruses, can they kill a person, and then of course the topic of exosomes. Right now we are living in what you might call a technocratic state. You get the technocratic elite priests of the mind. Germ theory, if you will, geopolitical control, you know, like Foucault talked about, so secondary if not tertiary. The lockdown will end when the seven, you, you, you know, when... Um, Kelly Brogan, uh, she claims to be a holistic psychiatrist. I have never seen evidence for contagion. I do not believe in pathogenic microbes. Which uh, is a bold claim, given that what she actually says is that there's no such thing as the coronavirus because it's not pr possible to prove that any given pathogen has induced death. A novel pathogen has yet to be identified, purified, isolated, or, you know, demonstrated to be causal in any pathological uh, setting. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with trauma-based mind control. This is the culmination. This is like their crown jewel. This has been in the works, incubating for decades. You mean like that movie, The Plandemic? Yeah. Oh, man. I'm pretty sure that most medical uh, professionals would disagree with that idea. Profiteering is where misinformation becomes disinformation. Not long after a Kelly Brogan claims viruses can't actually make you sick, it gets picked up by others and spread all the way down to a Raymond in South Carolina, who of course has his own large following. And before you know it, the lie has been normalized. Good morning, everybody. It's Aaron Elizabeth, Health Net News. Always know that there is hope and that the truth shall set you free. This spreading of disinformation seems to attract couples, and one of those couples, Aaron Elizabeth and Joseph Mercola, are seasoned veterans. Put down eight fingers if you're not getting the vaccine. Mask, a highly controversial topic, recommended by virtually the entire mainstream media and mandated by most public health authorities to be worn in public, in public places. But do they work? And are there any risk or harm to you? Could civil disobedience, peaceful civil disobedience, be a practical option? I think Joe McCullough actually tweeted out when we put out the report, you know, the Obi-Wan Kenobi clip, if you strike us down, we'll come back more powerful than ever before or something like that. We've actually looked at what they say in filings in court. So when they're deplatformed, they always sue the platforms. And so we've got literally their filings. Larry Cook, revenue demolished. Through Facebook, I shared online summits, donation requests, blah, 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 without my Facebook account because of censorship, my ability to secure ongoing revenue for my full-time activist work has been demolished. His words. Uh, Aaron Elizabeth Health News, I was just deleted off of all my platforms. That would be Facebook, Instagram, and I was also donated off of, or sorry, deleted off of <laughs> no donations, never taken donations. Extremists react quite fluidly to what's happening online. QAnon did exactly what ISIS did. When the social media platforms started deplatforming ISIS, they changed how they talked about 
ISIS operations and how they recruited. You know, when their posts start to get taken down, they learn from that. What did we do in this situation that got this post removed or got this content taken down? Let's not do that again. Let's find a way to rephrase um, what we're doing to get it past the content moderators and keep it on these platforms. You know, I tried to post that today. I tried to- I, tried I know, to you can't, I couldn't even do a swipe up. I know. Swiped it up and then they banned it. Blacked out. Yeah. So it's this cat and mouse game that never ends, um, unfortunately, for, for the tech companies. We, we've caused them a lot of pain, uh, Kelly Brogan and Saya G, in the last few days. I think Saya just lost his Facebook, didn't he? <laughs> so we have uh, Christiane Northrup, who's an OBGYN, but she's embraced alternative medicine, anti-vax conspiracies. She recommends all sorts of banana solutions for COVID over vaccination. The most powerful thing about Christian Northrup is that she's quite pleasant looking. She always posts videos of her stroking her cat, but it's only when you uh, know how malignant her misinformation is that you uh, see the sort of the dark, uh, the dark underbelly of the Christian Northrup brand. The ETs brought very advanced uh, technology that would have, we, it would have taken us out of the industrial age. And why was it the mainstream so down on vitamin C? Why was that? You know what he answered? Satan. <laughs> there were forces that have kept this information from the wow. general public and patented free energy and, and that kind of thing. When the microbiome of the reproductive tract the respiratory tract, the gut, when that's balanced, then he said, you can have HIV, you can have H1N1, you can have COVID, and you'll never, ever get sick. She knows in her heart that that is bull crap. I don't know how many of you are going to Washington, D.C. Remember, this is not about right or left. It is literally about getting our country back as a republic as a republic. How about an entire news channel of misinformation? Del Bigtree didn't make the list of the Big 12, but he's on the radar in Europe and has huge popularity in countries like the UK. On one hand, we're, we're losing our right to control what's injected into our children, but what happens if it starts affecting our ability to even hold our children? hold our babies or be with our children. Remember, money is made by keeping you on a social media platform, no matter the content. How much money do you think is made by feeding off your skepticism, keeping you enraged, fearful, and clicking every day? Uh, from your website, so you've been at this, I've been following you for over 15 years, so it's an honor to have you on the show. But this great reset, I think just maybe six months ago even, we would have been called conspiracy theorists to bring it up. Now it seems like it's in broad daylight. Um, what, what inspired you to write this article? Why is this important for people to know? It was the night before our Christmas day when Santa sends the threat. Locked down with no vaccine pass before the Great Reset. The Great Reset, another conspiracy rooted in a grain of truth. In this case, from a suggestion for social restructuring by the World Economic Forum. That suggestion has spawned a thousand misinformed offshoots, most of them now touted by COVID deniers as the grand agenda behind the pandemic. Well, it's our continuing effort to educate the public about the truth. Hi, I'm Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And I'm here to introduce a film called Medical Racism, the new apartheid that my group, Children's Health Defense, made in conjunction with a number of civil rights groups and groups that advocate for uh, the rights and the condition and the health of African Americans. And it's important that you watch this film because we all need to take responsibility for our own health care. Look, RFK Jr. RFK Jr. is the most frustrating member of the Disinformation Dozen because, of course, he carries that storied name, uh, a name that actually means something to the African American community in the U.S. as well. And yet, RFK Jr. has done more to undermine 
the health of African American communities with his ins insane claims that African blood is different to white blood, that black boys are more likely to react badly to vaccines than white, three times more likely than white boys. That's all immune system over aggressiveness. So you take a group of people that already have a you know, kick-ass kind of immune system over here, and you're going to overstimulate them, what do you think is going to happen? And unfortunately, the African-American community is much more likely to have that kind of response. I mean, he's literally gone around and tried to persuade African-American people not to vaccinate their children, which of course compounds the already existing enormous harm that's been done to African communities. African-American communities have suffered disproportionately, in part because you know, they can't sit behind Zoom all day like I do. They're more likely to have to go and do work which exposes them to COVID in the past year. We have shared values that subtend those scientific concepts, and those include bodily sovereignty, personal responsibility, and also a shared appreciation for the, the mystery of the human body and its innate capacity for healing. <laughs> yeah. So sovereign, sovereign citizens in the United States believe that the federal government is quite limited in its power to do almost anything. Whatever is working in modern society, they steal the, the language of the left, for example, or when it comes to uh, words like sovereignty, the language of the right, to cover and to, to give them defenses against assaults that are coming their way from people who are, who are spreading facts. So scientists, by journalists, by health authorities, and that makes them look really difficult to deal with. They're masters of framing and understanding how to steal their opponents' frames to defend themselves. They're constantly using jiu-jitsu verbally and idiomatically. So body sovereignty is a really powerful way of allying that all together. And this idea that there are forces who are trying to impose themselves upon your body, force you into, into, into being less pure. So let's take the worst case scenario that your state decides to mandate this vaccine or any vaccine. How are they going to enforce that? They are going to rely on the sheriff's department. And the sheriff has the authority to deny a governmental order. So that's why I believe it is so important to know who your county sheriff is and get to know them and get to develop a relationship with them and get them on your side. Their interpretation of the Constitution has led them to believe that the highest authority really exists at the level of the sheriff, so a very localized level. So the federal government does not have the authority in their minds to tax its citizens. Um, most laws that the federal government uh, institutes are invalid and don't have to be followed. Article 4, free inhabitant pursuant to the Articles of Confederation. Put the camera down for me. Is that, if, if, if it records, that's fine, mm. but I don't want you holding anything. Uh, no weapons, no weapons, all right, no. Okay, so what I'm going to ask you to do is the same thing. And get out of the car? Yes. No, I'm not getting out of the car. All you right. can go get your superior. Well, I am going to tow this car, and you cannot be in the vehicle while I'm towing this vehicle. Well, if you go get your superior, he'll clarify right now. that he can be set free because he does not that's have not to have a license. That's not going to happen right now, young lady. So either you're going to come out of the car on your own free will, or I'm going to assist you. I'm going to get out of the car and walk down to that house. No, you are not free to leave right now. Uh, you Are you saying you have authority over me? Yes, I do. You have proven authority over me. Yes, I do. How did you do that? The fundamental nature of misinformation and conspiracy is that it's non-falsifiable. So it, you, can, you can produce an endless amount of nonsense to knit together a narrative that then binds together groups. So sovereign citizens are also, you're really immersed in another world of conspiracy, of disinformation, um, and in lies in, in many cases. In this case, it binds together the anti-vaxxer with people from wellness communities and people who have right-wing leanings. And that's, that's the idea of body sovereignty, that there is someone trying to impose themselves on your body and you can take control of your body by rejecting everything that they offer you. So there's been this connection between the sovereign citizen movement in the United States and the individuals who have gotten involved in QAnon. 
And the reason for that is because they both trade in conspiracy, um, and they're conspiracies that are quite compatible with one another. But we see them uh, mixing in religiosity as well. So they say that these are you know, satanic devices being placed in the body. This goes back to anti-Semitic tropes that were being promoted you know, 100 years ago. Um, the idea that your children were going to be taken away, kidnapped, eaten. These are very, very old ideas. You saw a resurgence in the 1980s with the satanic panic. This was a time that more and more women were returning to the workforce. Kids were going to daycare. And there was a lot of anxiety about kind of a threat to the family structure. And so the idea was that kids were being molested at daycare. And that was a myth that was promoted and that was um, widely circulated within spaces that moms were, were part of. And then with QAnon, it was the same kinds of things. We have for too long made the debate over this really narrow. We've talked about the technology and can we get an algorithm that might fix misinformation. We've talked about the, 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 the political philosophy of freedom of speech versus the harm principle and you know it really hasn't gone anywhere. But no one's ever made this moral case. And it is a plain, straightforward moral case that people whose jobs it is and who profit from causing death, we shouldn't be doing business with them. Media conversations about disinformation usually live above our heads and don't seem to impact our personal lives. But for some, the disinformation is intensely personal and the situation can go horribly wrong. These people needed compassion and patience and help. Was to call them crazy. I made sure that the Department of Justice had the opportunity firsthand to meet with my client, the guy who was shirtless, with horns, tattoos, a fur, to have them understand and appreciate the condition, the special needs of my client. But a couple of things that we're finding that these individuals tend to have um, at higher rates than other types of political extremists is things like documented or suspected mental health concerns. Two thirds of the individuals that we've been looking at um, had mental health issues that were present before they bought into the QAnon conspiracy theories. Then there was this woman wrapped in a Trump flag who was shot while trying to break into the Senate floor. As Jim Murray reports, she's an Air Force veteran who tweeted, nothing will stop us the day before she stormed the Capitol. So everything from individuals suffering with bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, major depression, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder for individuals returning from military service. You'll see them going after Trump voters, so the tie in Charlene Bollinger, for example, you know, buy into some of the QAnon stuff. Del Bigtree was there on January the 6th at the Stop the Steal protests, uh, the, I mean, sorry, the domestic terrorist insurrection down the road at the Capitol. Two thirds is a much higher percentage than the rate of mental health that you, uh, concerns that you will see in the general population or among other types of extremists, which is usually more, you know, around 20 to 25 percent of individuals. So um, that is an alarming number. A sign on the door of Babbitt's pool business reads, Mask Free Autonomous Zone, better known as America. I'm like really heated. Last year as she drove to work, Babbitt recorded video in which she raged about Democrats. Because you guys refuse to choose America, America over your stupid political party. But I am so tired of it. Extremist movements often prey on individuals who are vulnerable to radicalizing narratives. So these are individuals who perhaps um, have dealt with some type of traumatic experience in their life. They're looking for a community to join and be a part of and looking for acceptance. This is one of the reasons we're seeing people uh, previously who've been veterans be drawn to QAnon. And so when we look at QAnon community in particular, we are seeing that there's a high rate of individuals um, who have gone on to commit crimes on behalf of the movement that have these histories of traumatic experience in, in their backgrounds. 35-year-old Ashley Babbitt served for 14 years in the Air Force. Anthony Maziot is her grieving uncle. She was a military police officer in the Air Force. Trauma is one of many triggers, but we do know that trauma makes people vulnerable. And because 
when people are vulnerable, they, they find comfort in a conspiracy theory. That's a way of explaining the world that then allows them to put their trauma into context. Now, what trauma also does is it makes people feel like outsiders. And QAnon is doing a lot of the same things that cults do and terrorist groups do, that the moment someone comes in, they are surrounded by a community that is giving them affirmation and they are giving them support and making them feel good about their choices, even though they're making terrible choices. Um, this is especially true among the female participants that have gotten involved in the movement. So a lot of women have suffered trauma that is directly related to their children. Cynthia Absug was arrested last week up in Montana on a charge of conspiracy to commit kidnapping. Investigators say a fellow QAnon believer who she called a sniper had come to live with her and that fellow QAnon members were planning this raid to kidnap the child. Absug is currently out on bond. Police say her child had actually been removed by Child Protective Services. Um, a lot of these women have had the chil their children removed from their custody because the households were abusive in one way or another. Um, and they're dealing with the trauma of losing, of losing their kids. What you actually see here is the targeting of demographic and psychographic uh, segments in a market. And that's what I see is that the industry lens is the best way to look at why they have particular brands. So one of them will go for African-American communities, one of them will be going for Latinx communities, one of them will be going for women of childbearing age, with of course a lot of the conspiracy theories around fertility. Fertility, babies, nothing is more personal to us all, but the internet takes the personal and makes it go wild. Yolanda Norris Clark first started personal fundraising online in 2013 after a sewage tank destroyed her home. Whatever the result, the business model stuck and you won't believe what she's selling now. I want to suggest to you that much, if not most, of what you think you know about childbirth might be wrong. Natural childbirth, that movement uh, that came out of, you know, the 60s and 70s, this was really a movement that came as a reaction to what was probably legitimately seen by many as an over-medicalized field. Obstetricians, gynecologists, even midwives are trained to look at birth from a very specific, very biased, very politicized, very narrow, and very unscientific perspective. Medical professionals tell us that they know that our bodies are working a certain way when we know how we are feeling. We know what is happening, whether the child is moving or, you know, how, however we feel, we know what we need and want. Our opinions, our wishes get brushed under the carpet. In the 50s and 60s, women would go to the hospital and what happened to them there was kind of a black box. Husbands were often not allowed in the birthing rooms. They were uh, given a, a drug that was um, popularly known as twilight sleep. So they couldn't remember what had happened during the birthing process. Most women are in a position of functional subservience to their care providers. This was a legitimately scary and uh, misogynist way of, of treating childbirth. And so there was a movement of people who wanted to um, put uh, the power of childbirth back in the hands of women. And I've given birth myself to seven healthy babies in my home without any involvement from medical professionals at all. This is called free birth. It's being able to have full control over your own body, your mind, your spirit, your time, your space, and any, everything around, around us. It's not luck. It's also not crazy. And believe it or not, it's not reckless or negligent either. We get to choose who we want around. We can even choose to have our children around, which I did, which was amazing. I personally feel like free birthing is what we are created to do as women. I wanted a lotus birth, so to me, delaying cord cutting is highly beneficial. However, lotus birth is when you leave the cord attached until it falls out naturally. So all the nutrients, everything the baby needs come through 
A home birth can be a safe and wonderful experience. We've done it in my family. But for some, skepticism of medicine is justified. My first birth, I... It was a planned home birth. When the time came for me to give birth, I contacted the hospital to let them know I was in labour and just in case anything were to go wrong. And they said there is nothing they can do because I am not under their care. I panicked and I called an ambulance and when they came, they treated me like I didn't know anything about myself or my body or my child. Within two pushes, baby was out, no problem at all. And straight away before I could even see whether it was a boy or a girl, the cord was cut, the child was put to the side and they started resuscitating. My child was rushed into the ambulance and I just had to follow. As we were in the ambulance, I just wanted to do skin to skin, just so I know, you know, at least I can give the baby the comfort of knowing that I am still here. My baby was taken somewhere. I still hadn't seen her yet. They put me into a cubicle and closed off all the curtains. And they said to me, um, you have to lay down, you have to lay there. And the doctors have to do checks. There was about eight or nine of them surrounding me. And I just felt um, violated. I felt disgusting because there was this doctor who came and he opened, he opened my legs and he just shoved his fist inside of me. So I was just asking for my daughter. I was asking for my child. They brought baby back to me and said, I am so sorry she didn't make it. And I did not believe that because when they told me she was in, in the room next to me, I could hear a heart monitor. I've worked in a hospital setting and I know what a heart monitor sounds like when a child is alive. Someone to come and tell me that my child was stillborn, that destroyed me. Often parents and moms in particular um, will join online parenting groups in real moments of loneliness, of isolation. It's often when they first have their kids. You know, anybody who has gone through having a newborn knows that it can be incredibly stressful and incredibly isolating. That I lost all trust in the medical system. And yeah, since then I decided no more hospitals, no more doctors. There are some very extreme parts of the natural childbirth movement that kind of defy political categorization. I'm thrilled to tell you about our brand new online course, the Free Birth Society Complete Guide to Free Birth. And to join the Free Birth Society, all you have to do is pay. The regular price of the course is $5.99, but we're running a very special pre-sale for the first 50 people to sign up at the um, One of them is this Free Birth Society, um, which is a, a group in Canada that promotes giving birth without the help of anybody. No midwives, nobody. Basically just, you know, do it on your own. The title of the most recent article in which I am publicly excoriated is called The Terrifying Story of How QAnon Infiltrated Mom Groups. So this article was published by Mother Jones. The folks who have been involved in that society in Canada have also been involved in COVID denialism. Techno-fascists have crippled small businesses the world over and coerced the global population into submitting to a large-scale psychological operation that includes forcing us to cover our faces under the pretext of protecting ourselves and other people from a flu-like virus with a 99.9% .9 survival rate in order to institute an artificial intelligence control grid, which is openly acknowledged by those very corporations that are benefiting from the global shutdown. Um, and they've sort of shifted from just talking about childbirth and you know the idea of wild, wild birth or free birth 
to railing against mask mandates and claiming that coronavirus is a hoax. It is just a total honor to be named alongside the likes of Dr. Christiane Northrup and Kelly Brogan, whom I count as a friend. The idea that I am somehow stealing people's money or manipulating people out of their money is beyond absurd. This course will never be offered again at that rate. So if you're feeling called, the persuasive tactics are, are really engaging. They are charismatic people, you know, who know what they're doing. And um, there have been some, some tragic outcomes, including um, the death of a baby. When I decided that I wanted to have a child, I told a trusted friend. She said, when I birthed my babies, it was just my partner and I present, nobody else. This idea is now called free birth. It was radical, sure, but it made sense. As I approached 42 weeks, the midwives became increasingly worried about me, but I refused induction. I was part of several private Facebook groups where women talked about unassisted childbirth. The group was full of successful stories. Not a single woman in the group had lost their baby. I had a couple of long contractions that lasted a full hour with no breaks. A pocket of water broke and I saw meconium in the waters. Now I knew something was wrong and I went to the hospital. They immediately checked the baby and couldn't find a heartbeat. He was gone and there was nothing they could do. I held him in my arms and cried for hours. He was so beautiful and perfect. He had a head full of hair and he was so cute with chubby cheeks. We contacted the Free Birth Society. It turns out joining the birth revolution isn't just a simple click. You have to sign papers and do a personal interview. The documents you sign include an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, and a waiver a waiver that may very well be needed by the forums because some of the more extreme content on unassisted birth forums, like abandoning medical professionals' advice entirely, ends in tragedy. I mean, I got an argument with a family member over what the population of Ohio was the U.S. state of Ohio. I mean, this is sort of bonkers, right? Because I was saying, oh, well, you know, you could do it something like the, the British National Health Service on a state level in America. And they said, oh, well, the population of Ohio is about the same as the U.K. And I said, well, no, it's not. You know, the population of the U.K. is near 70 million. The population of Ohio is around 11 million. And they said, uh, oh, well, you know, I grew up there, and that doesn't feel right. Counter argument is a bad idea. Don't argue with QAnon supporters about space lasers or lizard people or satanic cabal. Just, just don't do it, okay? And I said, well, it doesn't really matter how you feel about the population of Ohio. Like, there is an actual, show them the US census statistic. No, no, I mean, I think I have, you know, as somebody who's lived there, I feel like, you know, my view of what the population is is more likely to be accurate. There are millions of important ethical questions, scientific questions, moral dilemmas that we need to talk about. But if we keep talking about whether vaccines are causing autism or some Bill Gates microchip plot, we're wasting valuable time. QAnon has almost like a franchise operation. It's going to look very different in the United States as it looks in Latin America. In Latin America, it's going to pick up much more Catholicism than evangelical Christian belief. In the Middle East, it's going to be um, anti-Semitic. In Europe, it might be anti-Islam. But, you know, it looks different everywhere you go. If, if we're there, if, if that's where we are, then you do wonder, can we come back from that? In the end, the answer seems to be empathy. Empathy and patience. I, almost everyone I'm close with got it because we're just social people and, and so my, almost all my aunts and uncles who were elderly with health problems got it. And a couple of them did okay with it, but most of them ended up in the hospital and a couple of them, actually several of them passed away. One, one cousin and three um, family members, aunts, uh, two, uh, yeah, two uncles and aunts. So, but, so it definitely, in the beginning we were all, is it real, is it real? Is it, it's real. I mean, I, it really affected my family. At the bottom of every one of these conspiracy theories, there's a very 
factual problem with the society. And yes, it becomes wrapped in falsehood like a snowball, you know? So when it comes to vaccines and not trusting them, I think it's more so if you are a vaccine injury, you can't sue the company. They're not liable for that. Like, that's just a big, like, red flag for me. I'm like, like what do you mean? If, if your product injures me, then I, you should be held liable for that. Uh, because in our practice, if I do it, you, someone will sue me, right? Unless we're willing to acknowledge these true problems and address them in a way that is transparent and satisfactory to those of us who are vulnerable, like new mothers are, with very little information, a lot of uncertainty, and the stakes as high as it gets, we're gonna get another QAnon after this one dies out, if it ever does. I think it's gonna be very hard for institutions to rebuild trust. Uh, there has been a real erosion of trust in the media, in part because it is so hard now to tell what are reliable, and here I'll say, mainstream media is actually quite reliable. But there are so many other sources that are busy attacking reliable stories that it becomes very hard to see where the boundaries are. Uh, it's not just the content, it's not the, the stuff we see in our social media feed that is the real problem. That's just the um, consequence or the presentation of the illness. The deeper problem lies with data. It's the flow of data that uh, ends up in private hands, ends up with data mining firms, ends up with political consultants who use it to craft new messages, to segment their audience, and to target people with particular campaign messages that, that can be quite poisonous. There is a Nigerian prince with a million dollars just waiting to give it to you. If that happens to you, it's probably because you were targeted because you are a white suburban mom who spends too much time on her computer and they're scam artists who are seeking people like you, vulnerable in these ways and looking to exploit this vulnerability. One of the things that's really difficult for us now in public life is coming to appreciate that that nasty content doesn't always come from the Chinese government or the Russian government. It, it comes from our neighbors. We can ask too much of people sometimes, I think. And to say to a user of social media, it's their responsibility to educate themselves to such an extent that they can readily spot disinformation campaigns uh, and try and block them and themselves or persuade their friends uh, and family not to share them. You know, that, that plays a bit of a role, but I think to, expect, to say to somebody, you know, it's really down to you, uh, I don't think is good enough. And also, and I think when the social media companies talk about media literacy as being so important, I think that's what they're doing. They're basically saying it's, it's down to you to, to sort this out. As people need to know how to talk to their relatives who have been taken in by conspiracy theories. That's probably the question I get the most since January 6th. How do I reach my relatives, my friends who have fallen down this rabbit hole? And it's a lot more like bringing somebody out of a cult or bringing somebody out of an extremist situation than it is just doing a simple fact check. The most important thing, um, if you have a loved one that has um, gotten involved in one of these conspiracy theory groups, is to remain a presence in their life. Continue to talk to them, continue to stay involved, continue to ask them what's going on and what's happening with them. What's going to happen in all these cases is there's going to be a moment of doubt. And they're going to look for a social support network outside of the movement and the group to help them work through those feelings and to help re reinforce um, their decision to leave the group or the movement, which can be a really scary thing for them. Um, when that moment comes, that moment of doubt occurs in their life, um, they know who they can turn to for help in getting out. And, and that's really the most important thing that we can do. It seems that we are sort of ripe for one of those historic cataclysmic moments because we won't be able to remember what happened the last time this happened. And so I think we're talking global conflict, serious global conflict, um, not state on state, but human on the singularity, i.e. tech, authoritarian nation states, and pseudo-democratic states. Ultimately, you can't fact check personal experience, but legislators and data platforms can do their part to mitigate the dangers of disinformation.
And for the rest of us, we can all start listening. This may sound crazy now, but in seven years, 10 years, when it's happening, just remember that we were all trying to tell you this was going to happen. <laughs>